So, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think we're uh, we're on live. Rob, are we are we good to go? We're good to go. So, uh, in the inter interest of time, I, I think we'll we'll start this uh, this session again for uh, some of you who are joining us uh, for the first time at the Sam Cohen Auditorium at the St. Boniface Hospital Albertson Research Center, as well as uh, joining us online. Um, my name is Dr. Lori Kirschenbaum. I'm the director of the Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences here at St. Boniface uh, Research Center. And uh, you're joining us uh, today in this context of the 25th anniversary of the Cardiovascular Sciences Naranjandala uh, Research Day Forum. And uh, part of the forum, uh, we incorporated a public address uh, by one of our, our star researchers, Dr. Ina Rabinovich Nikitin, that will focus on women's heart health. Women's heart health is a uh, major drive for the Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences, St. Boniface Hospital, and the University of Manitoba. And with that, we address the inequities in uh, women's heart health in research, teaching, and training. And for that reason, we are seeking uh, developing a very important prominent program in, in women's heart health that will lead to better care for uh, underrepresented individuals, particularly women in the cardiac living with cardiac disease. It's my uh, distinct uh, honor and uh, privilege to uh, acknowledge the Wurzakowski family, Conrad and, and uh, Monique, for being here today. They were recently honored with the Jack Litvak Service Award uh, for their families, and particularly Conrad Sr.'s philanthropic contributions to cardiovascular care and other areas of uh, their interest in the city. So thank you. Why I'm mentioning this is because the uh, philanthropic support and the support of the uh, St. Boniface Hospital Foundation, President and CEO, Dr. Uh, Miss uh, Car Karen Fowler, doctor, doctor, uh, Ka Karen Fowler and her team, um, it's a terrific organization to work with. Uh, they work with the public, they work with us, and uh, they identify areas that really need to be fortified. And why I mention this is because Dr. Rabinovich Nitikin's lecture is based upon the kind contribution, generous contribution, of the Wurzakowski family. Uh, when Ina was appointed, Dr. Ina Rabinovich Nitikin is a assistant professor at the Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences in St. Boniface Hospital, an assistant professor uh, at the University of Manitoba's Departments of Physiology and Pathophysiology. And her primary area of research is in cardiometabolic disorders, uh, pregnancy-associated cardiovascular diseases, and the impact of circadian disruption on uh, cardiovascular health in predominantly women. Um, she received her undergraduate degrees and graduate degrees and ended up training with us here at the Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences. She's published um, over 40 research articles in top-tier journals. She has received many honors and awards, including the coveted, highly, highly recognized American Heart Association uh, Lewis and Arnold Katz Prize. And this is really a tremendous achievement for any investigator, but really spectacular for her achievements. Now, why I mentioned the link between Ina and the Wurzakowskis is because part of our ability to recruit and retain Ina in Winnipeg was naming Ina the uh, Evelyn Wurzakowski Professorship uh, in cardiovascular sciences. And that was only made possible by the very kind and generous philanthropic support of the Wurzakowski family. And that's very important because it brings the public, it brings the local support to translate it into the foundation's ability to help us move cardiovascular research and ultimately patient care forward. We've identified Ina as one of the up and coming stars. She's absolutely terrific. Um, as I mentioned, she's received many honors and awards. And um, I don't want to belabor the, uh, the talk because I want to give time for her. But um, again, I want to express my gratitude to you, uh, Monique and uh, Conrad and your family and Conrad Sr. and obviously your mom, Evelyn, for uh, the generous contributions uh, to the foundation and to allowing us to uh, support Ina's uh, important cardiovascular research. So with that, I'll stop and uh, introduce uh, Ina. Ina's talk is gonna be on heart health in women. It's time for a checkup. So let's see what that's all about. Ina? Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to first thank everyone for joining us today in person and uh, on the St. Boniface uh, YouTube channel. 
So first a disclaimer, I don't have any uh, conflict of uh, financial conflicts of interest. Uh, I don't have any biotech companies just yet. And any informa information that I will be providing today uh, should not be considered as medical advice and is not intended as a substitute for medical professional help, advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare providers with any questions you have regarding your medical care because only your doctor knows your uh, medical history. So let's talk about the heart. What is heart disease? Heart disease, uh, which is also known as cardiovascular disease, is a broad term of conditions that affect our heart and blood uh, vessels. Heart disease is a chronic condition, which means that it lasts uh, for a long time and it's mostly uncurable. And in worst case scenarios, uh, heart disease can lead to heart attack and uh, eventually death. The most common form of heart disease is called coronary artery disease, which you can see uh, on the picture here on my left. And coronary artery disease is basically a fancy name to uh, describe our arteries when they're being clogged with fat. Other types of heart disease that I will be mentioning today is uh, 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 stroke and heart failure. So heart disease, as you already heard, is the leading cause of death worldwide. And uh, here, this is a graph that was taken from uh, the World Health Organization uh, website. And you can see um, a combination of statistics for both men and women, and for both sexes, uh, heart disease is the leading cause of death. But I would also like to draw your attention uh, to the last 20 years and the uh, change in death cases that we had over the last 20 years. So if you will see, uh, okay, it's not working. Oh, so the white dot is uh, 2000, and the blue dot is uh, 2019. And you can see that uh, over the last 20 years, the biggest increase in death cases was uh, in, re in relation to uh, heart disease. So the Canadian Women Heart Health Center took this information and divided it uh, to men and women. And what they found is that while still heart disease is uh, um, the number one cause of death for both sexes, it's actually on the decline for men, but it's rising for women. So heart disease is the number one killer for women worldwide. And in fact, heart disease accounts for more deaths every year than all cancers combined. One in three women are affected by heart disease. And in order to better explain you these numbers, I want you all to think about 10 women in your life, 10 women that you care about in your life. It could be your mothers, your sisters, your daughters, your uh, friends, coworkers, any 10 women that you care about in your life. Three of them will be affected by heart disease or may already have heart disease. So why is it? Why uh, heart disease is on the rise for women? Uh, there are basically five main uh, problems when it comes to heart disease in, in women. And the reason for that is that women are understudied, underdiagnosed, undertreated, undersupported, and underaware. And in this presentation today, I would like to go through these five problems in order to better explain why uh, women heart uh, disease is on the rise. But in the end, I also have good news. And the good news is that actually with the right information and action, it is possible to prevent and postpone heart, heart disease and improve the chances of surviving. So let's start with uh, women being understudied. When we say that women are understudied, we first uh, mean that uh, historically, uh, heart disease used to be considered as a man's disease. And the reason for that is that men usually develop heart disease 10 years earlier than women. And this is due to hormonal protections because uh, women have higher levels of estrogen and progesterone, which is proven to be cardioprotective. And that's why women uh, uh, during, before menopause are more protected against heart disease. In addition, there's uh, differences in uh, cultural differences in, and differences in life habits when it comes to men and women. Uh, historically, uh, men used to work while women would uh, stay at home. So men uh, were more exposed to uh, stressful life. And uh, again, I'm, I'm saying historically. And uh, also, um, uh, alcohol consumption rates are higher among uh, men. And uh, while going to the bar and having a drink after work, it's usually accompanied by unhealthy food consumption. You know, having a steak or ribs with, with your uh, drink. And unfortunately, all these risk factors increased uh, um, the um, uh, disease cases in men compared to women. And that's why uh, people still think that this is a men's disease and not women's disease. But in addition to that, much of what we know today about heart disease is based on research in men. So in the 70s, FDA actually released regulation that banned women from participating in clinical trials. 
And the reason for that was uh, based f f uh, first on uh, safety concerns because uh, women in childbearing age could be pregnant without knowing that. And uh, we all know that uh, different treatments or drugs can be very toxic uh, for babies, especially if it's uh, drugs that are st still, still being tested. But also women have hormonal fluctuations uh, throughout the months. And these hormonal fluctuations can cause uh, different outcomes to different experiments and basically increase the variability in different uh, experimental uh, studies. In addition to that, uh, women are also less likely to participate in clinical trials. And uh, according to report, the reports, it's mostly because women uh, um, are busier and don't find enough time to commit to clinical trials. But uh, in the early 90s, FDA changed the regulation and actually started uh, encouraging women to participate in clinical trials. But uh, still, even today, uh, two-thirds of the clinical trials are still based on men and not on women. So over the last 30 years, when we started seeing more uh, clinical trials uh, for women, we actually noticed some significant changes uh, between men and women when it comes to heart disease. So uh, now I will uh, quickly go through some of these major changes that we noticed in uh, uh, um, heart disease for men compared to women. And first, I would like to start with uh, the physiology of women's heart uh, compared to men's heart. So um, the cardiovascular system is actually the second most different system in our body after the reproductive system. That's how different our hearts compared to men's heart. So if we look at men's heart and the women's heart, we will see that the women's heart are smaller and also their arteries are smaller compared to men. Also the heart rates in women are higher compared to, to men. Some risk factors in women are also different compared to men. Some risk factors can be specific, such as pregnancy complications, which we will uh, be talking about. But some traditional risk factors, such as uh, smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure, and family history of heart disease, can actually carry stronger relative risk in women compared to men. Also, as I mentioned, women develop heart disease later in life. And while most women experience their first symptoms of heart attack after the age of 65, after menopause, men usually have their first symptoms of heart attack uh, around 55 years old. What else did we learn? We also learned that heart disease may look different in women compared to men. But unfortunately, most guidelines for diagnosis are still based on studies for males. And that leads to uh, being, uh, uh, women being uh, uh, not diagnosed or treated uh, in time. That is also true for testing, because again, some standard diagnostic tests uh, are still based on uh, research in men, and uh, they have been proven to be uh, inconsistent when it comes to uh, diagnosing uh, women. And in addition to that, women's symptoms of heart disease are also different compared to men. And in fact, uh, because the symptoms are so different, heart attack symptoms are not recognized in over 50% of women. So, what do, what do I mean when I say that the heart attack symptoms uh, for women are different uh, from those in men? Some symptoms are actually the same. So women also experience uh, chest pain, pressure, discomfort, uh, sharp and burning uh, chest pain, unusual tiredness, uh, weakness, shortness of breath. These are all symptoms that can be experienced by both men and women. But in addition to that, women can experience additional uh, symptoms that are not usually seen in men. For example, women are more uh, likely to experience upper or abdominal uh, um, stomach pain, jaw pain, back, shoulder, or right arm pain, racing or uneven heart rate, nausea, trouble sleeping, and even ab uh, abnormal excessive sweating. So all these symptoms are mostly seen in women and not in men. And in fact, women are more likely to present with three or more of these symptoms in addition to having a chest pain. And due to lack of knowledge and awareness of these symptoms, uh, heart, disease is, uh, heart attack sorry, is uh, mostly unrecognized in 50% of women. And that leads to women being underdiagnosed. Women are also slower to identify the signs and symptoms of heart event because they are less aware. And that leads to even scarier number that early heart attack signs are missed in 78% of women. Again, 78% of women are not being diagnosed with early symptoms of heart attacks. And why is it? Because women delay getting help due to fear, embarrassment, living alone, not wanting to bother anyone, or misinterpretation of signs and symptoms. And I'm sure many of us can think about at least one woman that would feel that something is wrong with her body and wouldn't want to go to the doctor and would say something like, I don't want to bother my doctor. I just saw him last week. He has so many patients to take care of. 
or women that live alone and feel that something is wrong with their body and want to call the son to ask for help, but he's just having a date night with his wife, so maybe I will wait until tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes, and I need to take care of the grandkids because they are sick. So we basically postpone uh, getting help. And this is very important because every minute counts. And getting treatment as fast as possible is actually very critical to survive and to minimize damage. Because once we're having heart attack, the cells in our heart start dying. And if we get uh, treatment as fast as possible, the uh, cell deaths of our hearts can be stopped and decrease the damage and the outcome of the heart attack. So <clears throat> that leads also to women being undertreated. And under treatment for women is mostly due to differences in signs and symptoms, and also due to lack of awareness and knowledge gaps. So lack of awareness and knowledge gaps can be among the general public, but also among healthcare providers. And unfortunately, even today, uh, many healthcare providers are not aware of these differences. And uh, many times we hear about women coming to their doctor and complaining about different things that are happening with their body, like, you know, I'm more tired right now, I have, uh, um, I'm sweating at night, and, and different symptoms that don't make sense. And many times the, the doctor would just say, you're just being too stressed. You have kids to take care of, your, your, uh, your work is very busy. Just relax, it's all in your head, don't worry, everything will go away. I, I see some nodding in the audience. <laughs> so uh, we also talked about risk factors. So as I mentioned, some risk factors are specific for women and not for men, but other classical or traditional risk factors can actually have greater risk for heart disease in uh, women compared to men. And in the next few slides, I would like to go uh, through these risk factors in order to increase awareness and uh, knowledge. So let's start with pregnancy complications. Most people don't know that having a pregnancy complication can significantly increase the risk for heart disease. Some of the main pregnancy complications are preterm delivery, high blood pressure, and gestational diabetes. So why is it? This is because pregnancy is like a stress test to our body. Because when we are pregnant, our body needs to take care not only of our needs, but also of the needs of the baby. So that leads to increased uh, blood volume, uh, increased heart rate, and altogether it puts lots of uh, stress on our body. And therefore, many times, different heart disease that are usually silent, uh, underlying uh, heart disease that are silent in our body, actually rise during pregnancy. And therefore, pregnancy many times is viewed as a window into future cardiovascular health. Now, uh, many times uh, uh, we think that after having the baby, after delivery, all these risks are basically uh, declined. But that's actually not true, because yes, having a baby can eliminate all these diseases that we had during pregnancy, but the risk is still there, and the heart disease can come later uh, in life. It is also very important to know our family history, because many people don't know that the pregnancy complication may increase the risk for heart disease not only in the mothers, but also in their children. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about uh, blood pressure. So we all know that uh, normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. So 120 is also called the systolic uh, blood pressure, and that represents the contraction of the heart. 80 is the diastolic number, and that represents the relaxation of the heart. So 120 over 80 is contraction over relaxation. And everything that is above 120 over 80, especially when it's 130 over 80, is called high blood pressure or hypertension. Unfortunately, high blood pressure rarely shows any symptoms. Usually people don't experience anything when they have high blood pressure and they're not aware of that. And that's why also high blood pressure is called the silent killer. So uh, high blood pressure is often underdiagnosed because there are not no uh, symptoms. And high blood pressure increases significantly the risk for heart disease and stroke. And in women, high, uh, high blood pressure can increase the risk for heart disease by 3.5 times compared to women with normal blood pressure. It is also very important to know that specific groups of women have even a high risk for high blood pressure and heart disease. For example, women that take oral contraceptives, and especially obese women that take oral contraceptives, are more at risk for having high blood pressure and therefore heart disease. Diabetes. So most people know that diabetes is a very big uh, risk factor for heart disease. So there are three main types of diabetes. Type one diabetes is when the body does not produce enough insulin. Type two diabetes is when the body produces insulin but cannot use it well. 
And gestational diabetes is a temporary condition of diabetes that occurs uh, during pregnancy. So women with diabetes have more than double the risk for heart attack compared to uh, non-diabetic women. But what's even more interesting is that diabetes doubles the risk for second heart attack in women only and not in men. Gestational diabetes, which happens during pregnancy, can increase the risk for type 2 diabetes, again, not only in the mothers, but also in their children, and therefore, again, increase the risk uh, for heart uh, uh, disease in both mothers and children. Cholesterol. So we all know that cholesterol is a type of fat in our blood. The source of cholesterol can uh, either come from food, when we eat uh, um, uh, food which is uh, rich with uh, fat, and also from our body. Our body can also produce uh, cholesterol that can ac be accumulated in our blood. So there are three main types of cholesterol. There is the HDL, which is the good uh, um, cholesterol, so we want more of that, more of the HDL. There is the LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, and it's bad because it's leading to buildup of plaques uh, on our blood vessels, so we want less of the LDL. And there is the triglycerides, which is whenever we have excess calories, they are stored in our body as a fat that is called triglyceride, and also we want less of the triglyceride. So the total cholesterol divided by HDL is the ratio that is used in order to measure our risk for heart disease. When it comes to women, one in two women have elevated cholesterol levels, but after menopause, even more women are suffering from high cholesterol. And this is because we lose the protection of estrogen and progesterone. And it's very important to know that even a relatively small decrease in LDL of one millimole per liter can significantly reduce our risk for heart attack by 20 to 25%. So again, the formula is that we want more of the HDL, the good cholesterol, less of the LDL, the bad cholesterol, and less triglyceride. So all these three types are our total cholesterol. Smoking. So we all know that smoking is very bad for our body. It affects badly each and every system in our body. But what many people still don't know is that women that smoke have uh, usually their heart attacks 19 years earlier compared to women that don't smoke. And why is it? Because smoking increases our LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, which we want less of that. It lowers our good cholesterol, the HDL. It also speeds up our heart rate and increases our blood pressure. And therefore, altogether, it causes our heart uh, work much harder. And therefore, uh, women that smoke have two to four times uh, more chance of having heart attack compared to non-smoking women. But the good news is that it's never too late to quit smoking because when we quit smoking, we can actually recover the damage uh, that was caused to our body by smoking and actually even vaping. So 20 minutes after we stop smoking, our blood pressure and heart rate starts to decrease. After two days of not smoking, not only the, the sense of uh, taste and smell is coming back, but also the heart attack st risk starts to decrease already after two days. After one year of not smoking, the risk for heart attack decreases by 50%. But the best news is that after 15 years of not smoking, our risk for heart attack is equal to the risk of someone who never smoked. So again, the message is that it's never too late to quit smoking, and we can still recover the damage that uh, smoke caused to our body. <clears throat> Let's talk about cancer treatment and uh, risk for heart disease. So uh, the most common treatment for cancer is uh, chemotherapy and uh, radiation. And while this is the most beneficial treatment for uh, cancer, uh, since it can cure cancer and also um, uh, improve our uh, life survival, uh, it also has some significant uh, side effect. And the side effect of chemotherapy is called cardiotoxicity. So cardiotoxicity is basically a heart damage that is caused from chemotherapy or radiation. And uh, um, cardiotoxicity can increase the risk for heart attack, cardiomyopathy, and heart failure. So uh, usually <coughs> when people uh, undergo chemotherapy uh, treatment, they're being assessed for their cardiac uh, function in order to see if they have cardiotoxicity. But in order to reduce the risk for cardiotoxicity, it's very important to eliminate many of the risk factors that can actually cause cardiotoxicity. So it's very important to quit smoking before starting chemotherapy, to manage our uh, weight, to manage our blood pressure, to manage sugar, to basically manage everything we, we can, everything that is in our hands before starting chemotherapy. Mental health. So many people are not aware that mental health also can uh, affect our risk for heart disease. 
And women usually uh, suffer more from depression, actually two times more from depression compared to men. And depression doubles the risk for heart disease in women uh, compared to men. And why is it? Because increased release of stress hormones during uh, uh, depression is not good for our heart. Also, women that are depressed are less likely to follow a healthy lifestyle. They're less likely to exercise, uh, to have physical activity, to eat healthy. Also, depression increases our blood pressure, uh, irregular heart rate, our cholesterol is also going up, and it increases the risk for blood clots. Menopause. <clears throat> so as we said, before menopause, women are mostly uh, more protected from heart disease compared to men, especially if they don't have other uh, risk factors. Menopause usually happens between the age of 45 and 55. And after menopause, our risk for heart disease is increased and sometimes even more than uh, compared to men. Early menopause, uh, before the age of 45, whether it's natural early menopause or by surgery, increases even more the risk for heart disease by 50%. And today, uh, one of the most common treatments uh, to deal with the symptoms of menopause is hormonal therapy. But hormonal therapy can be controversial because it can also increase our risk for heart disease. So in this figure here, you can see uh, some of the considerations that should be taken before prescri pres pres prescribing hormonal therapy. For example, if we have some risk factors, hormonal therapy may not be recommended for us. Or if menopause started too early, or if menopause already happened, let's say, 10 years ago, so it might be a little bit too late for, our, uh, for uh, and increase our risks. But in order to know if hormonal therapy is good for us, it's best to consult your doctors because they know your medical history and they can uh, decide if hormonal therapy would, would not increase your risk for heart disease. And the last risk factor that I would like to mention is autoimmune disease, such as arthritis. So autoimmune disease uh, causes damage to the body's own tissues as a result of immune dysfunction. And autoimmune disease can involve multiple organs and systems, including the heart. Women are uh, more likely to have autoimmune disease compared to men. And it's very interesting that heart disease is the number one cause of death for women with arthritis and with lupus. So again, in order to decrease our risk for heart disease while having uh, autoimmune disease, it's very important to eliminate risk factors that we can manage. This figure summarizes uh, the risk factors that I uh, discussed. And as you can see, heart disease can strike women at any age, from early age to older age. And the factors that lead to heart disease originate already in young women and develop over time. So you can see that in young women, um, the young women on the left, uh, they usually don't have many risk factors. Maybe the main risk factor in younger age is uh, early menarche age. And that's why, because there are no, no risk factors, that's the best age also to, um, uh, to educate for healthy uh, life habits in order to reduce the risk for heart uh, disease. But also, it is very important to know the different heart disease that can rise in uh, different ages, because uh, around 20 to 30 years of age, usually we see more spike in uh, depression and mental disor disorders, and uh, the risk factor of depression can last throughout life. Uh, also, we can see uh, later in life uh, increase in cancer cases and um, um, arthritis, for example, and again, these risk factors can last for longer times. And uh, menopause, of course, it's for a shorter period of time. So it's very important to know that each age has its own risk factors, that some can last for the whole life, but it's very important to know the risk factors of each age. Another problem that uh, women are dealing with is that women are being under-supported. So women that have heart attack or heart disease can be referred by their doctors to cardiac rehabilitation programs. So cardiac rehabilitation programs are multi-component interventions that uh, are personalized for the individual needs uh, uh, of someone who has a heart disease. And cardiac rehabilitation programs deal with many aspects and risk factors that can affect the risk for heart disease. For example, they uh, offer nutritional uh, counseling, uh, weight management, blood pressure management, lipid management, uh, diabetes management, and uh, cardiac rehabilitation programs were proven to be not only clinically uh, effective, but also cost effective for patients with uh, various heart conditions. And this is because cardiac rehabilitation programs uh, reduce the chance for a second heart attack and the overall risk for dying from cardiac event. But unfortunately, women are less likely to be referred to cardiac rehabilitation programs and 50% less likely to participate in them. 
So here in Winnipeg, we have the Refit Center, Cardiac Rehabilitation Program, excellent program. Uh, it's located on Taylor Avenue, right? <laughs> so if you know anyone that can benefit from this program, please ask them uh, to, re to be referred to this program. The last uh, problem that I would like to talk about when it comes to uh, women's heart health is uh, under awareness. So women are still under aware of the threat uh, they face uh, from heart disease. And women also don't take action against heart disease because they do not uh, put their health as top priority. They think that they are not old enough to be at risk. They feel too busy to make changes in their lives and they do not want to bother. And uh, this report from Heart and Stroke could not uh, come in better timing. This was published uh, two weeks ago. So Heart and Stroke um, performed an excellent poll for Canadians to understand uh, what is the knowledge and awareness uh, among the Canadian population. And they found uh, very alarming uh, conclusions. For example, uh, what the Heart and Stroke found is that one in three Canadians do not know that the signs of heart attack can be different in women compared to men. And I hope that after the presentation today, these numbers will uh, change in the next poll. Also, seven in 10 Canadians do not understand the, the risk factors for heart disease and stroke. And in addition, almost one in three Canadians mistakenly think that if they witness someone having a stroke, they should immediately drive them to the nearest hospital as quickly as possible instead of calling 911. So as I promised, I also have good news today. And the good news is that heart disease is preventable. In fact, 80% of heart disease can be prevented and can be cha changed by managing or modifying risk factors. The other 20% that is harder to, to change is due to age and due to uh, genetic history. But the 80% that we can actually affect uh, can be done by uh, managing our blood pressure, managing cholesterol, managing diabetes, quitting smoking, getting uh, mental health or psychological support, and managing our weight. And in order to better explain why it is important to eliminate our risk factors, I would like you to have a look at this graph that basically shows that our risk factors uh, for heart disease uh, are working by multiplication effect, not by addition, but by multiplication. What does it mean? It means that if we, for example, have two risk factors for heart disease, let's say smoking and diabetes, our risk for heart uh, disease is increased by four times. But if we have three risk factors for heart disease, for example, smoking, diabetes, and high blood pressure, our risk for heart disease is increased by 10 times. And that means that eliminating even one risk factor can significantly decrease our risk for having heart disease. So how can we do that? How can we prevent heart disease? There is a lot that we can all do in order to reduce the risk for heart disease because heart disease is largely preventable. So here's a list of some of the things that we can do in order to eliminate uh, heart disease. We should be more active and keep moving. We should eat healthy, variety of healthy foods, manage stress, quit smoking, limit alcohol consumption, and also very important to get regular checkups with the doctor. So when it comes to physical activity, I think no one would argue with me that physical activity is very healthy for us and it affects uh, positively each and every system in our body. But unfortunately, it's very hard to find the motivation for physical activity. So in order to motivate you uh, for physical activity, I gathered a few uh, tips uh, for motivation. So first of all, when we uh, do physical activity, it is very important to remember why we do it. Why do we do physical activity? This is in order to decrease our risk for heart uh, disease, to increase our life, our, sorry, uh, our, our survival to basically see our kids graduate high school and go to college and get married and see our first grandchild. This is all, all very strong motivational uh, efforts to uh, do physical activity. Also, physical activity can be as a family time. Uh, it is very easy, you know, to go for a walk with, uh, with the kids or with the spouse and to encourage each other to exercise uh, together. Even walking our pet is considered exercise. Uh, another very easy way to exercise is basically just to walk as much as possible. Always take the stairs and not the elevator. When you go to the supermarket, park your car as far as possible and not at the front door. Count your steps, either by, you know, Fitbit or your cell phone or any other device, because that also gives you an idea of how much you moved in a specific day and how much more you need to move today. Exercise outdoor. 
Exercising outdoor is very important not only for our mood and reducing our stress, but also to encourage exercising. And the window for exercising outdoor here in Canada is of course very small, but there is a lot we can do even during the summer to exercise, whether it's uh, hiking, biking, I personally like kayaking, everything you can do outdoor is uh, encouraged. And lastly, it's very important to imagine and visualize your he healthy heart and body. When, <clears throat> when it comes to healthy eating, there is lots of information that uh, can be found on the website of Government of Canada, where I took these uh, pictures from. And uh, the Government of Canada um, recommends a healthy and a balanced meal to look like uh, this plate here on the left. So a balanced meal should uh, consist of 50% uh, vegetables and fruits, 25% uh, fruit, uh, protein foods, and 25% uh, whole grain foods. When it comes to drink, always choose water. Don't choose any juice or pop or anything else. But it is also important not only what we eat, but also how we eat. So it is very important to be mindful, mindful of our uh, eating habits. Don't uh, eat while playing on your phone or watching TV or anything like that. Uh, cook more often. It's also a very good family activity that can encourage each other to uh, eat, uh, um, eat healthier. We need to enjoy our food, and even eating meals with others can encourage us to uh, eat healthy. It's good to know to read the food lab labels. <coughs> Sorry, to, <coughs> to read the food labels, because this uh, will give us information about how much salt is in the food, how much sugar, how much fat, and avoiding processed food is very important. Processed food is very bad for our health. And marketing tricks is also something very important to know because usually the unhealthy food has better marketing compared to the healthy food. And uh, also talking to your doctor is very important and to get regular checkups. And when you go to the doctor, it's very imp important to prepare for your visit. It's better to think about your complaints and concerns so you will better deliver the information to the doctor so that the doctor can help you also. It is important to bring the list of medications that you're taking because the doctor can have a look at all medications and maybe replace something on, or see if some combinations don't work very well. But it's even more important to actually take your medications because I hear many cases that people are being prescribed medications and just don't take them or don't take them as instructed at the specific time of the day with or without specific foods every day and so on and so on. When you go to the doctor, you need to ask them three important questions. What is my main health problem? What do I need to do? And why is it important for me to do this? And because we get lots of information when we go to the doctor and it may be very overwhelming, it's good to take notes. So don't feel embarrassed just to take notes of what the doctor is saying, or even take someone with you that will help you to ask the question and to listen to the information. This is a list of some other very important questions that you need to uh, ask your doctor. What is my risk for heart disease given my personal risk factors? Are there any tests needed at this time to check my risk for heart disease? And if so, what are these tests? How often should these tests be done? What are my values or results for these tests? How do my values and results compare to what is considered normal? Are there any lifestyle changes that will help me lower my risk for heart disease? Should I be taking medications to lower my risk for heart disease? And also very important to ask what support is available for me to help achieve my goals. So in the last half an hour or so, I mostly talk ab talked about uh, the risks for heart disease and what each and every one of us can do to reduce the risk for heart disease. And in the last few minutes, I would like to talk about what we here in San Boniface are doing to reduce the risk for heart disease and to help each and every person uh, in uh, Manitoba and also in Canada. And this is establishing a dedicated women's heart health uh, program under the leadership of Dr. Laura Kirschenbaum and the, the Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences. So the Women's Heart Health Program came from a need, a need to close the gap in knowledge, enhance research, increase awareness and prevention, and improve patient care. So how do we do that? We do it by increasing research capacity, whether it's basic research or clinical research, improving patient care, enhancing education, education to all ages from high school students, through graduate students, and professional education to doctors and nurses. Also, we work very hard on advocacy and awareness, whether it's through uh, public forums like this one or through other ways that I will show in the next uh, slide. Uh, we also work a lot on prevention by increasing knowledge and uh, lifestyle changes, 
cardiac rehabilitation programs, patient peer support programs, which is basically uh, programs uh, where women that experience the same type of heart disease can meet and support each other and help each other to go through it together. And we also invest into population-specific care because um, specific populations such as the indigenous population, Asian populations, Hispanic populations can all have different risk factors. And that's why even the treatment and the research approach should be different according to each population. So what do we hope to achieve by that? What is the expected uh, outcome of the Women's Heart Health Program? The expected outcome is to increase survival rates, improve quality of life, and reduce the burden on the healthcare system. So in Canada, there are currently six established women's heart health program. One in Vancouver, one in Toronto, one in Ottawa, two in Montreal, and one in Halifax. And as you can see, Winnipeg and the Prairies is still not on the map. But this is about to change, because right now we're in phase one of establishing the Women Heart Health Program. And during phase one, we already established very strong uh, relationship and collaborations with the other Women Heart Health Programs over Canada and internationally, such as the Barbara Streisand Women, uh, Women, uh, Women's Heart Center in Los Angeles. What else did we achieve over the last uh, year or so, uh, over the phase one? Uh, we achieved establishing of uh, different research programs, such as uh, heart failure, pregnancy complications, cardio-oncology, cardiac repair, uh, nutrition and heart, all uh, these research programs are aimed uh, to women. We also invest into uh, patient peer support, whether it's by SCAD clinic, which exists with uh, uh, St. Boniface. SCAD is spontaneous coronary artery di dissection. It's a disease that uh, mostly occurs in women. 90%, 90% of the cases is actually women. And right now we're working on establishing a peer support group for uh, women with pregnancy complications. We also uh, do different activities to increase education. We collaborate with the Youth Bio Lab to uh, increase knowledge and awareness among uh, high school students. And we are right now in the last uh, stages of approving a graduate course with the University of uh, Manitoba on women's heart health. We also do lots of work on advocacy by public presentations, heart-related events, and through the media. So I know I provided lots of information today, so I just have a few take-home uh, messages that I would like to share with you. Uh, first of all, heart disease is on the rise for women, and it is also the leading cause of deaths for women worldwide. Heart attack symptoms are not recognized in over 50% of women, and the types of heart disease can be different from men compared to women. Women are also uh, sometimes at greater risk for heart disease because they have specific risk factors, and some of the traditional risk factors can adversely affect women more than men. But it is important to remember that there is a lot we can all do to help reduce the risk for heart uh, disease because heart disease is largely preventable. And in order to take care of others, it is very important to first of all take care of uh, uh, ourselves. Just like, you know, when you're on the airplane and you're being told first to put the mask on you and not to, on, on the person who sits next to you, so same when it comes to heart disease. And therefore, I hope that after the presentation today, you will start conversation with other women in your life in order to increase awareness and knowledge. And lastly, I would like to prom promote uh, this event, uh, Wear Red Canada. Wear Red Canada is um, the international uh, national um, uh, Women Heart Health uh, Awareness Day. So that will take place on February 13. And we will have uh, different activities and programs here in um, Winnipeg and also uh, in Canada. So please stay tuned and please wear red on February 13. And lastly, I would like to uh, thank some very important people and organizations. Of course, huge thank you to St. Boniface Hospital and the St. Boniface Hospital Foundation. A very big thank you from the bottom of my heart to the uh, Evelyn Worsikowski family and to Michael Nesbitt for your generosity and for your philanthropy and for your support in personally my research, but also in the Women Heart Health Program. I would also like to thank the Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences, the University of Manitoba, and the Canadian Women Heart Health Center. Thank you. We have a few minutes. Wow. Thank you very much. That was really quite spectacular. I don't know, um, we're, we're online, I don't know if um, we'll have time for some questions. But um, if you are interested in a couple of questions, yes. are there any questions from the audience that would, or YouTube? Or YouTube? 
Anybody that know YouTube questions? Okay. Anybody from the audience that want to ask Ina maybe one or two brief questions in the interest of time? Karen? So that's an excellent question, and um, just like we heard yesterday by the senator, unfortunately we mostly feel it from uh, male doctor, not so much from female doctor. So yes, we do work on uh, closing this uh, knowledge gap. First of all, by the graduate course that we're doing. So it, first, it will be available mostly for graduate students, but then we will expand it to uh, uh, med school students as well. And also, we do lots of uh, advocacy. Um, 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 activities in order to increase this uh, knowledge among the healthcare population. And we work a lot with clinicians that can also spread the uh, message. And the Women Heart Health Alliance also has many activities to deliver the knowledge to healthcare providers. Anything else? Bram. Oh, Bram's got a question. All right. In a uh, very good overview talk, I uh, enjoyed it very much. Uh, Question is, uh, you showed nicely with cigarette smoking, the risk that's associated with it, and when if you remove it, how you naturally goes down to, actually can eliminate it if you stay long enough. You also showed for depression. We have a big mental health crisis in the, case, in the nation. Uh, what happens if you treat the target effectively with antidepressants or whatever uh, method that's utilized? Do you see a cumulative risk reduction in heart disease specific to females? Wow, that's a very good question. Um, I know there is a lot of research going in this area, um, but unfortunately, I don't know about the specific risk for women. You caught me <laughs> off guard, so uh, this is something I will have to look into. Great presentation. First of all, thank you so much for being so informative and giving us all that information. Thank you. Um, just a quick question, which I found a little bit contradictory. So for example, oral contraceptives, they keep the estrogen and progesterone high. Then why those students are more, uh, so not student, why those women are more prone to heart diseases if they have the protection of estrogen and progesterone? Yeah, so um, oral contraceptives, the balance between the hormones, some, some oral co contraceptives can be only estrogen, a combination of uh, estrogen and progesterone. Today, most of the available uh, oral contraceptives have very low dosage of uh, estrogen and progesterone, but it can still increase our levels of cholesterol, actually. Many women that are taking oral contraceptive have higher cholesterol levels. Mm -hmm. And uh, in general, although it's low uh, dosage, women that al also have obesity have another uh, risk factor. So together with oral contraceptive, it increases uh, the risk for cholesterol and heart disease. Okay. Thank you. I, I think in the interest of time, we'll let you off the hook. Um, I want to thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rabinovich Nikitin, for this wonderful overview on women's heart health. This is going to become part of our public outreach um, from the Institute and on behalf of the uh, St. Bonham's Hospital Foundation, promoting uh, women's heart health in, in Manitoba. Um, and so I want to thank you all very much for being here, uh, especially uh, Wurzikowski's. Thank you very much for being here. We've, uh, we've arranged a very, um, I was going to say heart healthy, but maybe not so much. Um, we have a small reception outside in the atrium, so I would welcome you all to uh, join. Again, uh, thank you, Ina, so much for a great presentation. That was really, really wonderful.